My name is James Reed. When I was 26, I made a hell of a lot of money. By the way, it was legal. I had an uncle in Iowa that I hadn't heard from in years. He won the Powerball for over $200 million. Two years later he died, and it turned out that I was the only relative left. By then, with his investments, his legacy was worth $275 million. So suddenly, without any action on my part, I had a mountain of money. My new financial manager advised me to buy a bigger house, but it seemed stupid. I already had a house and really liked it. It was on a river that I loved, and I had everything I needed. Nobody knew about this money except my old friend, one of my college professors. The investment company that manages the money meets with me every month in Grand Rapids. The meeting usually lasts over the weekend. My financial manager at an investment company was Mark Braxton. Mark seemed like a nice enough guy, but he wanted me to spend my time and have fun and enjoy myself, and I wanted to continue living the way I was living before. He also seemed overly friendly with any woman who crossed his path. Well, I didn't have to like him. The income from this money alone was enough to equip a damn army. The taxes were high, but I wouldn't buy a bigger house. Heck, financial manager Mark Braxton wanted to do anything to cut the government's share of my money. I knew that he received 1% a year of what his company managed. But that didn't make any difference to me. I will never go broke. Not in my life. The commission was nothing special except that the investment company treated me like a god. I didn't care if he got 1% of $500 million or 1% of $300 million. I told everyone at the investment company to call me James, but they called me Sir until I told them that the next time someone at their company called me Sir, I would find another investment company. Now everyone calls me James. Mark calls me James. The nice receptionist calls me James. Even the janitor calls me James. Keep in mind, good people, I was mostly happy. I had everything I needed. Well, almost everything. I didn't have a good wife. I didn't have children. So I felt lonely at times. But I had a good job, good friends, and a great river to fish. I was a high school history teacher in Baldwin, a small town in the upper lower peninsula of Michigan, and I really enjoyed my job. History has always been my passion, and teaching has been fun. It was nice to see several faces light up when I told them some of the stories from different periods. Of course, most of them wouldn't light up, even if you shined a flashbulb in their eyes. Hmm. I wonder if the flash explosion will work. I think no. This is for really bad people. Most of these students were simply inert. Well, the first summer after I got the money, I went to Alaska. I paid $6,000 for a week of fly fishing. That was great. I've flown by helicopter to five different rivers. The fishing was out of this world, except there were no close friends to laugh with when I fell into cold water, no one to drink with after a good fish catch or that night at the lochi, and no one to joke about what got away. There was no one to talk to about life and the great future. Fishing is an obsession and a solitary activity, but friends make it better, so the money was invested and the profit was invested and I made more money. Jesus, it was now over $350 million. It seemed a shame that there were simply more of them and they weren't doing anything good. Everything changed at the end of June, two years after I received the inheritance money. Of course, the change was a woman, what else? Her name was Beverly Capston. She took several of my history classes. She called and asked to meet with me. School ended in the first half of June. This happened often. Children would call wanting a letter of recommendation. I assumed Beverly wanted the same thing. A letter of recommendation for college or a job. I looked through my records for all the kids who graduated from high school. She was third out of 81. Hey, it's a small town. I knew that Beverly had applied to Ferris State University in Big Rapids. I also knew that she was accepted. So what did she want from me? She was supposed to arrive on Friday afternoon, so that day I tied some flies for the river, changed the leader and line on the old reel I was using as a spare, drank a beer and fished a little. She showed up at one o'clock in the afternoon, just as I started preparing lunch. Hi, Beverly. I'm grilling fish for lunch that I caught this morning. I also have a green salad, sliced tomatoes and corn on the cob. As for drinks, diet Pepsi for you and beer for me. Thank you, Mr. Reed. Can I help you with anything? Hey, 
I cook outdoors. I never need help cooking outside. I taught this girl for four years in high school. I never really looked at her. I mean looked. She was a student. She was a woman. She couldn't be touched. Well, she was no longer a student. But does this change anything? Hmm. We would eat at my picnic table in full view of the road and anyone who might pass by. Beverly was 18 years old. She wasn't the prettiest girl in the class, but she was very, very far from being the ugliest. Plus, the ones who looked the sexiest seemed to have an IQ, well, a little better actually than the fish I caught that morning. In between bites of food, I looked at my former student. Beverly was sweet. She was not a beauty. She was attractive. Age and knowledge would greatly increase her attractiveness. Her dark brown hair framed her oval face, beautiful cheekbones, eyes blue and warm like a summer day, full lips. She was five feet five inches tall, maybe a hundred and twenty-five pounds. As I remembered from the river swim parties, she had a good figure, again more medium than curvy. She was going to become an ordinary woman, but I think if it weren't for the money, I would be a pretty ordinary guy myself. Beverly started by saying, I'm going to Ferris State University in the fall. I have enough scholarship money to pay for school. I don't have enough money for a dorm room. And I don't have enough money to buy a car so I can drive around. Round trip. Now that was another problem. Oh? I need a job, either in Big Rapids, so I can live in a dorm, or here in Baldwin so I can commute back and forth. Beverly, what do you want me to do? I don't know anyone in Big Rapids, and I was hoping that you might know someone who has a job that I could get. Now, I knew what the problem was. I actually knew some people in Big Rapids. There were some good people there and some not so good. The ones I knew who had jobs open weren't very good. There's a hell of a lot of work in Baldwin in general. Baldwin was a tough town. Everyone had to earn their own living. Any job she could get here or in Big Rapids would be at minimum wage and there were many students on campus looking for jobs. I didn't see what I could do for her. So the question came again, what do you want me to do? The fish was ready. I set out the paper plates and served the food. We sat down at a table where everyone could see us. We ate and talked. She sipped her diet Pepsi, and I sipped my damnation ale. Hey, 7% alcohol can be fun. If you could find me a job, that would be great. I will always be grateful to you. You really need to live near Beverly's school. Commuting there and back, even if it's only 50 miles, will be a hassle. Plus, your grades will suffer if you work. I can't go to college without working. I saw tears in her eyes, and I have no one else to ask for help. I saw a glimmer of an idea in the distance. It looked weak in terms of ideas, but I needed to talk to my finance manager, Mark, before I could take it too far. Beverly, I am or was your teacher. There is a place that will hire you without even asking me. The Swan is hiring dancers. I know, I've been there before. The owner says I can work there, but... Tears streamed down her face. I would have to dance naked, and I would have to let him... This was not news to me. I knew Sam Bly. He was an ass, and barely teetered on the edge of the law. All of his dancers were over eighteen. Too young to drink, but old enough to work in bars. I'm guessing he told her about lap dances and back rooms. You can borrow money. I want to be a teacher. And you know what teachers make. I just can't have that much pay after I graduate. About Bly, if nothing else comes up, will you work for him? If I have to, I'll do it. But I won't have sex with him or any men there. I felt the iron core of pride inside this woman. There was one more question that I had to ask before I could continue this conversation. Beverly, if, and I really mean if I can arrange something for you, what will I get out of it? I was really curious what she would say. Mr. Reed, if you give me the opportunity to go to college, I will do whatever you ask. Now that was an interesting statement. I lived in a small town. I was meeting a woman in Grand Rapids a good 90 minutes each way. I could only go there on weekends, and even then, not every weekend. She was fine. I was definitely not in love, and marriage was out of the question. Damn, she was great in bed. 
I was getting everything I needed. I was ready to ask a question. I never thought I would ask any woman. What if I asked you to let me get you into college? Whatever you need until you graduate, what would you do for me? You're asking me to sleep with you? How often? Where? When? What about the boys I dated at school? Birth control? What will happen if my dad finds out? He'll kill you. I suddenly saw all sorts of problems with this idea. I actually didn't know what I was talking about. I decided to pause it. Where else have you been accepted? What other colleges? The only college I applied to besides Ferris was the University of Michigan Dearborn. I was accepted there too. Fine. Beverly, here's your homework. As soon as you can, show me your annual cost report for Ferris State University and U of M Dearborn. I know there are no dorms in Dearborn, so start with living expenses. I need data within a week, and don't hope for it too much. It's just a shot in the dark. I'll be in Grand Rapids this evening and pick up some newspapers from Dearborn for you. Also apply to Eastern Michigan University. It was a stressful job for her, but I wanted to see what she could do. I knew what it was worth. With dorms at Eastern, the cost over four years would be $35,000, once you factor in a car, gas, and other expenses. Well, such as clothes and food. At the University of Dearborn, I valued it at over $45,000. There were no dormitories in Dearborn, and apartments were not cheap. I don't think Eastern will accept me this late. I knew that Eastern would accept Lucifer himself if I gave them enough money. So is Harvard. Don't worry about it, just do your homework. You can use the computers at school if you need to. I remembered that she didn't have a computer at home. She always used the school ones to prepare the projects I assigned her. She looked at me with a strange look. Are you going to force me into bed with you so I can go to college? I'm trying to stop the men at Bly's from getting into your pants. So what do you want? Three or five times a week? Stop. I didn't say I wanted to sleep with you. As a college student, you will have the right to engage in any activity you want. If you decide sex isn't in the picture, cool. I'm sure something is possible. Come up with. You could always join the army and get money for college if you had to. I'll let you be my first man if you send me to school. So, how many times, Mr. Reed? I found myself thinking about this. That was a good question. If I wanted to get her, what year would be a good date? What about STDs? Pregnancy? I needed to think about this. Then it dawned on me that she was negotiating. How many times? God. I looked at her. The tears stopped. Her face was calm. Beverly, I will ask a man to meet with you. He owes me a great debt. He will help you get into Ferris or any other school you choose. You don't have to give yourself to anyone. If he looks at you the wrong way, I will order him. I still need the expense report for Ferris, U of M, Dearborn, and Eastern. And I'm not sure I want you to be that obligated to me. This is too close to rape. This is not rape. This is fornication. Did this barely legal girl think she could use me to get college for her body? If I was married to you until you finished college and paid for everything, and then you divorced me, would that be fornication? Will you marry me? Do you want to have three children? Cook and clean? Have sex with me whenever I want? Why the hell did you even come here? It's a small town. You have a good idea of what kind of person I am. I was starting to get angry. Did this young woman want to marry me or just make a deal to go to college? Was this marriage a schoolgirl's passion? Was she really willing to sleep with me for the sake of getting a college education? Or did she really want to marry me? How the hell did this meeting get to this point? So what was I supposed to do? Will you marry me? The reason I was angry at Beverly was because she seemed willing to go to almost anything with me to get her education. I could see that her strong pride was holding her back from working at the Swan, but she seemed more than willing to do the same with me. I felt uncomfortable with her tough, brutally frank negotiations. Perhaps that is why I abandoned the idea of marriage. Now I was angry with myself. It wouldn't cost me anything to help her financially. How did we get to the point where she would either become my mistress or marry me? I knew what she wanted and what she was and wasn't willing to do to get it. What did I want? 
I wasn't really ready for marriage, let alone a fake one. I felt awkward at the thought of using it. I had no problem getting all the sex I needed. As I thought about it, I found myself admiring her courage and her goals. I taught because I loved the challenge of shaping young minds, the sparkle in too few of their eyes when they came out of their shells and began to want to learn. I taught history because it was truly my only passion. Too few students went beyond what I could give them. Here was a chance to help one person do just that. I knew then that I wanted to see how far she could go, and as long as she made significant progress, I would help her. I needed to think things through, so I wasn't going to tell her everything I was thinking right away. Beverly, let's refrain from talking further about this for now. I want you to do the homework I gave you, and also write a letter about your goals. Why do you want to be a teacher, and why history? I added, don't worry about anything else now. It just confuses the issues. Focus on what you want to do, and why, don't think about how to do it. Looking confused, Beverly replied, Okay, Mr. Reed, shall I give the information back to you? Enough of this, Mr. Reed. School's out, you're an adult now, you've turned 18, and you can call me James. Like I said, there's a guy working with you. Call him later when everything's ready. His name is Mark Braxton. Here you go. His business card. Like I said, he should always be professional when working with you. If he isn't, Call me right away. Here's my business card. With these words, I shook her hand and walked her to the door. As I thought about our conversation, it occurred to me that the school I went to might be better than the ones we talked about. They had an excellent history program with degrees up to Ph.D. I attended Western Michigan University, WMU, in Kalamazoo for my master's degree and became friends with one of his professors, Al Trent. Al was a funny guy with a thick beard, a brilliant mind, and history was his life. He was still teaching in the Graduate School of History at WMU. Al had a wife of 30 years and four daughters ranging in age from 18 to 28. Al was one of the few people who knew about my wealth and how it came to me. After thinking about it for a few more minutes, I realized what I wanted to do. I called Al and told him what I wanted to do with Beverly. I did some research into Beverly's background and learned how difficult it was for her as a child. I relayed some of this information to Al and, without going into detail, told her how impressed I was by her passion for learning history and her desire to teach, and that I wanted to help her. At the same time, I told Al that I wanted to spend some of my money on something useful. Al, I'll be honest with you. I know it's late in the admissions process, but I think we can work something out. What I propose is to fund two professorships, one at the undergraduate level and one at the graduate level in history at WMU. I will also establish five fellowships for new history teachers in West Michigan. If they teach at a high school in West Michigan, I will also give them a $20,000 stipend every year for five years. Finally, I will fund two interns in the history department, one graduate and one undergrad. I don't want to use one of the scholarships for Beverly, but I want her to be given one of the internships without explaining to her how she got it. I think that it's important that she earns money on her own to boost her self-esteem. Do you think we can do this? James, it won't be easy, but let's try. Establishing scholarships and funding faculty will take time. I suggest you also make a fairly significant, immediate, non-qualified donation to the school. It will show good intentions while we work things out. Here's another suggestion. Given what you told me about this young lady, I think it would be a great idea to have her live with us for the first year. We have plenty of space and she would benefit from spending time with my girls. This will allow her to not be alone or feel too lonely and she will immediately have a circle of friends. The girls can look after her and I can direct her to the right classes, etc. Al continued. Perhaps she could come over for a few days in about two weeks and we could see how it could work and my wife could help her with the paperwork. Remember, Sarah volunteers with the Dean of Students. Like, you know, there's a bus that would make it pretty easy for Beverly to get there and back. I think it's about a three-hour trip. Al, that's a great idea. Why don't I come over next week and invite you and your family to dinner and talk things over? You can set up a few meetings with me and we can get started. I agree with the idea of donating immediately. 
How about a hundred thousand dollars to start? I think you have a great idea with Beverly. I'll arrange a visit for her. The idea for this project came from a conversation with her, but this gives me a chance to give back some of what you gave me. I had no money while I was in school and it was really difficult. Without your problems and inspiration, it moved me. I don't think I could finish. I called Mark to set up the financing process for Beverly. After discussing the details, I wanted to make sure that one thing was clear to Mark. Mark, I know you have a reputation for being a womanizer. No, don't deny it. I don't want to hear from Beverly that you tried to do something to her. If you do this, I will brutally attack you and the investment company. Beverly was depressed when she left her meeting with Mr. Reed. First, there was her behavior. She talked to James as if she were some kind of slut. Contemplating her words, she blushed furiously. Then, when he abruptly ended the conversation and sent her off to do research, Beverly felt rejected that James didn't like her. This hurt her vanity, although she knew she was being stupid. With every class she attended, she became more attached to him, a schoolgirl in love with him. He treated her with respect and support. He gave her self-belief that she could overcome her past and become someone. Now she's ruined everything. I wish I knew how to behave around men, saying to herself, I feel like I'm wasting my time. I had my chance, and damn. She went to school to gather information for a meeting with Mark Braxton. Cost information was easy to obtain from the school's websites. She also made a comparison between their history programs, hoping it might impress James. Reviewing her research, it became clear to her that her goals were too vague. Getting rid of Baldwin and being proud of her accomplishments had to be byproducts of what she wanted to do. She realized that she really loved history. The stories of people and places fascinated her. She felt the need to give to others what she had received from James. As she began to express these thoughts for the purposes that James asked her to do, she began to think about how hard her life had been. Her father worked for a small logging company that harvested the hardwood left over from the vast forests, cleared in the 1800s. Sometimes he had to travel further north to harvest white pine trees. He was often out of work, and when he did work, he was absent for several weeks at a time. She remembered her mother as fragile and very pretty. As she got older, she realized that her mother was drinking constantly, and when she was about ten, her mother began bringing men home. This terrified Beverly, and she locked herself in her room whenever her father was not home. One morning, her father unexpectedly returned home. He found his wife unconscious on the floor with a man sleeping in his bed. He exploded with anger and began to brutally beat the stranger. Beverly heard her father screaming and came out of her room. When she saw her father beating a man, she started screaming. Her father turned in horror, grabbed his daughter, and led her back to her room. When he returned to his bedroom, the man was no longer there. He called the police and his wife was arrested for child endangerment. She was given 90 days in jail and given a court order not to see her husband or child. Beverly never saw her again. This man was a transient who was picked up by her mother. She didn't even know his name. Being a relatively small town, it has been the talk of the town for several years. Since then, Beverly has become a little afraid of men and their passions. Her father took a low-paying job at a local logging plant so he could be home more with his Bev. She became very shy, and when she entered high school, she tried to stay away from boys. The two times she dated, the guys became promiscuous as soon as they were alone with her. Both times, she jumped out of their car and ran home. After that, she didn't date anyone. Part of the reason was her clothing. They didn't have much money and she had to make most of her dresses. They were cute but simple compared to what the other girls wore. She always kept herself clean and tidy. The only person who was kind to her was her history teacher, Mr. Reed. He was the only man who seemed to respect her. While applying for scholarships, she realized she would need to find a job. The only place that seemed to have any work available was Sam Bly's bar, The Swan. When she met Sam, he showed her the premises of the bar, made her watch how some of the girls dance and how they dress, or rather, undress. Returning to his office, he asked her, Would you like to dance for me? Since it was the only job available, she hesitantly said yes. Sam told her, Take off your blouse so I can appreciate your charms. 
Knowing that he always went to the women's locker room and would still see her, she slowly unbuttoned her blouse with trembling hands. Overcome with sudden lust, Sam asked, How bad do you want this job? She replied, I have no other choice. He replied, Okay, then there is only one step left in the interview, and the job is yours. She began to put on her blouse with relief when Sam said, Wait, go ahead, take off the rest of your clothes and the job is yours. Beverly turned pale and ran out of the room, and Sam shouted after her with a laugh, Come back when you're ready. This led her to an interview with Mr. Reed. She decided that she would do everything in her power to get him to help her find a job. She was scared, but figured that at least he was attractive, he was always kind to her, and that she, sort of, liked him. As much as it scared her, by this time she felt she had no choice. Although he was nicer than other men she knew, he was a man, and she knew what all men expected from women and what she had to give to Mr. Reed. She shook her head and realized that she had been sitting here for an hour. She concentrated and soon completed her task. Later that evening, she called Braxton to meet him for lunch the next day. Shortly after, James called and told her about Western Michigan and going to meet the professor and his family. He told her about their history program and a little about the professor and his family. Beverly was shocked and worried. How much will it cost her? Remembering James's reaction earlier, she hesitantly asked, James, what do you expect from me, sex? He replied, Beverly, and was silent for a moment. Beverly, sex is something that should come from love. You don't love me and I don't love you. If that changes, we can talk about it, but for now I respect you and I want your respect back. All I'm asking is two things, that you really commit to your studies and that you and I meet for lunch at the end of each semester to review your progress and discuss your current goals. Mark called and said you've set up lunch. He'll give you all the information and tools you need. Work with him for a year, letting him know if you need anything, okay? Okay. Thank you, James. She almost whispered as she hung up. The next day, she met Mark Braxton, and he immediately made her nervous. He was very handsome and impeccably dressed. He didn't do anything directly, just a lot of touching, sitting, standing, close, random touching. Beverly blushed every time and moved away a little. It seemed like Mark was always right in front of her, slightly brushing her legs or chest. She thought about what James had said. Call me if he gives you any trouble, but was afraid to make a problem out of it. Mark, for his part, was fascinated by her and began to think about how he could get her into his bed. Fuck James and his damn orders. Who he slept with was none of James's business. Lunch was at a very nice French restaurant, and Mark told her everything she needed to know. He gave her $500 for clothes and another $500 for expenses, bus, lunches during her visit to Kalamazoo, etc. Beverly thought it was too much, but Mark insisted he was just following orders. Mark gave her the outline of the plan, for her to talk to Al about the internship program, informing her that she must speak a foreign language, and giving her a credit card with a $5,000 line of credit limit to use as an emergency fund. She had to send credit card receipts to Mark for registration. Beverly actually went on the trip and everything went wonderfully. The professor and his wife treated her very well, and his daughters took her clothes, shopping, and to several informal gatherings, including a pool party. She had to buy a swimsuit and, of course, chose a conservative one-piece swimsuit. It didn't matter. The boys were still crowding around and she was constantly blushing. Sarah helped her fill out the application and was able to enroll her in an intensive summer French program. A week later, she moved to Kalamazoo. Bev struggled with French, but Sarah's fluent French helped her greatly. She went home for a couple of weeks to visit her father and then returned to WMU and started her new life. Beverly became friends with Al's girls. They sort of adopted her. She went on some dates, always with a group. One day, the guy she was with caught her in the restaurant hallway and kissed her. At first, she was scared. Then she pushed the boy away and ran back to the ladies' room. That night, as she fell asleep, she thought about what it would be like to kiss James. She felt her face flush and felt a tingling sensation. So she covered her face with a pillow and fell asleep. Summer French classes were very intense for her, but it helped her understand how different college is from high school and really apply herself. She started her first year somewhat slowly, 
but gradually achieved an AGPA. She had several electives, taking a class on Renaissance art history and several music appreciation classes. These electives really opened her eyes, helped her become more confident, and she became more aware of the challenging but rewarding opportunities that life has to offer. Mark walked away from the phone, thinking, What an asshole James is! Just because he has so damn much money? That shouldn't stop me from having a little fun if the girl wants it. Mark began to think about his last conversation with Erica Johansson. She worked at a local law firm, and he had been seriously entertaining her for a year. He told her several times about his client, James Reed, about his money, and how he was not using it for fun, but simply wasting it. God forbid. During their last meeting, he told her about James's plan for Beverly. Erica said, God, I wish I had some of that money. I had no idea how hard being a lawyer is. The hours are killing me. They discussed it and began to come up with a plan. Mark is tired of working with other people's money. He was 35 years old and a confirmed bachelor. He made good money on some investments, but nothing that could give him the lifestyle he felt he deserved. He liked fast cars and women. Lots of women. Yes, he thought. I'll get James Reed, and then I'll get as much of his money as I can. He needs to carefully craft a solid plan with Erica. They discussed this for several months, gradually refining the plan. Mark would arrange for Jamie's to meet with Erica, and she would use her girl wiles to lure Jameis into a trap. Meanwhile, Mark will find a way to take care of James. One of Mark's concerns was making sure she stuck to the plan. He wrote the script, and after one of their steamy bedroom scenes, he handed it to her. Erica, let's make sure we have a plan in place. Here's a script for you and one for me. I'll read mine first, and then you read yours, okay? With her nod, Mark completed his part of the task. After discussing it and answering a few questions, he waved her over to read her part. She picked up the script and began to read. After I meet James, I'll make sure we dance a little. I'll try to move closer to him so he can feel my breasts pressing against him. I'll try to get him to the balcony in the clubhouse, holding his hand tightly and making sure he kisses me. I will ask him to take me home and I will find a way to seduce him. I will give him the best sex of his life. I will lead him into such a fog that he will want to marry me as soon as possible. After we get married, I will act like a loving, faithful wife until the car accident happens. Then it's money, 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 Mark said, great. And they discussed the plan for a while, refining it, figuring out how to get the most out of it. Unbeknownst to Erica, Mark had taped the session and was going to edit it to make sure she didn't do something stupid like actually fall in love with James. Mark continued to meet with Beverly periodically, although a phone call was all it took. He didn't know why, but it seemed to him the most important thing in the world to seduce this girl. It wasn't that she was as beautiful or had a body like Erica's. She was just unattainable and definitely not interested in him. Mark really loved a challenge. Every time he met her, he tried to touch her as often as possible, mostly seemingly innocently, but occasionally touching her breasts or what he thought was her one great asset, her lovingly round, firm ass. Mark spent a lot of time thinking about having as much money as he could spend. He remembered his first job after his sophomore year of college. The only job he could find was as a meter reader for a gas company in Battle Creek. After being chased all summer by more dogs than he could count, he vowed that he would become rich and never have to work so hard again. Even though Mark was making a lot of money, mostly from managing James's investments, he wanted more. He never presented expenses without supplementing them. He worked off kickbacks from investments. Heck, the reason he wanted James to build a new house was so that good friends would give him a finder's fee for the design and construction work. At his next monthly meeting with Braxton, James asked how things went with Beverly. Mark told him everything was ready and she had already moved in. James was impressed that Beverly had attended a summer intensive French course. It was not a requirement, but would give her a good head start in learning French. He knew she had studied Spanish for four years in high school. Beverly first caught his eye in an American history class in junior high. James enjoyed trying to get kids to really think. 
sometimes it was a real challenge. One approach he used was to present alternative histories and ask students to write a paper about how a changed event could cause changes in future history. The event for the article that Beverly wrote was the departure of the Mayflower. James provided the context. How Mayflower settlers established modes of government that laid the foundation for the subsequent formation of the American government. He then explained and had the children brainstorm some of the circumstances that could have led to the Mayflower not going to sea, or worse, not arriving safe and sound. The assignment was to speculate on how the absence of the Mayflower and the Pilgrims would have affected the formation of the new country. Beverly's article was undoubtedly the most imaginative, not the best written, but she demonstrated the ability to think and reason. The article really showed her innate, intense curiosity and thirst for knowledge. From then on, James paid more attention to her, meeting one-on-one -on -one to continue probing her mind. The whole episode with Beverly turning to him for help and the conversations he had with his old professor Al made James rethink his life. He loved teaching, but was there anything else he could have done? He thought about it for a few weeks and then called Al and asked if he could come over for dinner. He made the trip that weekend. He met with Al earlier in the day for a couple of hours and then invited him to lunch. They discussed their options and Al asked some probing questions. Over coffee, James said, Let's see if I can tie it all together. I think it's clear that I'm going to give up teaching. I really enjoy it, but I think it's time to move on. I'll focus on two things. The first is to expand opportunities for more history teachers and improve their effectiveness. The second is to try to influence the quality of the teaching materials available. The first thing I can do is continue what I started, but at a few other Michigan universities. I can arrange for some sabbaticals to allow for more research and publications and I can create programs that encourage more high school history classes and make them more interesting. One of my thoughts was to get graduate students to go into high schools and share some of what they are working on. It would be interesting for both them and the high school students. The way I see it all is focused primarily on the West Michigan area. I don't want to take over the world. I just want to make a difference where I can. The second idea would be focused on the publishing side. James continued, through a friend, I know of a small publishing company in Detroit that primarily produces history textbooks and history trade publications, and it sells. I want to buy this company and have my friend run it. Lately, I have not been satisfied with my investment company or the efforts of my account manager. A few months ago, I started looking for investment opportunities that I could do on my own. Gradually, I find situations where I personally know the key players in the company. I also look for similar situations in an industry that I think would be interesting to me. I found a few, including one at a security company that looks like a winner. How does this all sound, Al? That sounds great. I'd suggest you contact a publishing company. Also set up a fund to coordinate donations, scholarships, etc. You should run that yourself. I'd be happy to recommend a few names for an oversight group to provide overall guidance and make recommendations. This board will include teachers at all levels, students, and a couple of key legislators. Great, Al. Let's do it. With these words, James decided to change his life. He seemed to be throwing himself into philanthropy in a big way. But over the last year, he had some thoughts about trying to do something. In a way, it would be a little selfish of him to continue teaching when he could do so much more. He just wasn't the type to spend all his money lounging around on a big yacht off can chasing bleached blondes. That evening, he had dinner with Al's family. Beverly sat down opposite him. At first, she was quiet, almost embarrassed. But everyone was laughing so much, teasing each other, that she came out of her shell and joined them. After dinner, James asked her to take a walk with him. Almost nothing was said until they sat down on a bench in a nearby park. Beverly, I think we started off on the wrong foot. I love and respect you. I would never ask you to do anything you don't want to do. I just want you to have a good life. I know that happened to your family many years ago. I should have known more about you before I would sponsor you. I'm sorry I had to dig into your past. I want you to study history as much as you want. I know that you can do it. With that, James stood up, kissed her on the cheek, and walked her home. At the end of Beverly's first full semester, 
James met with her again. This was the first time he invited her to dinner. He chose a quiet Italian cafe that had excellent food. Since he was coming from out of town, he was a little late, and Beverly was waiting for him at the bar with a cup of tea. Beverly, you've really changed. You look... kind of... okay. God, Bev, you look great. Blushing slightly, she replied, Thanks, James. You look pretty good yourself. They sat down at their table and ordered a very tasty oso buco for lunch. James drained most of the pitcher of homemade Chianti. Beverly was much more animated than he had ever seen her before. He talked to her about her course and asked some pretty insightful questions. She answered with enough depth and clarity to please him. When it was time to leave, James kissed her on the cheek and said, I'm really impressed, Bev. Keep up the good work and let Al or Mark know if you need anything. Kissing her cheek again, he watched her walk away, turning once to wave at him. His heart trembled slightly, but he attributed it to the oso buco and wine. The image of her in a black dress never left his mind the entire way home. Later that year, James went to a party hosted by Mark Braxton at a country club that Mark had joined several years earlier. James didn't really want to go, but Mark kept pushing him so hard that he didn't see a graceful way out of this situation. At the party, Mark introduced him to the charming Suede Erika Johansson. Mark told him she was interning at a law firm in Grand Rapids. She was tall, slender, with long blonde hair. After chatting for a while, Erica asked him, Why are we letting this great band go to waste? Let's dance. With these words, they went out onto the dance floor. There were a few fast numbers, and then the group performed a slow dance. James pulled her a little closer, but Erica continued moving until she was leaning against his chest. When James danced with her, he discovered that she was not so slender. Her breasts were firm and wonderful to the touch. From time to time, he would accidentally touch her ass with his hand, and it was clear that Erica was very athletic. She didn't complain when his hand moved lower. After two more slow dances, the group took a break. James, let's go to the veranda. I'm warmed up from dancing. She took his hand and led him through the large doors onto the veranda overlooking the small lake near the first three. She stood at the railing, looking at the full moon, and James was captivated by her beauty. Almost in a daze, he leaned down and gently touched her lips with his. She froze for a minute, opened her mouth slightly, and ran her tongue over James's lips. The kiss quickly became passionate, and James held her tightly to him. Suddenly, James pulled away. Erica, I'm sorry, I don't know what happened. God, I'm so embarrassed. James, James, it's okay. I admit, I find you terribly attractive, and I've never felt so comfortable with a man before. Don't say anything else. I can hear the orchestra playing again. Let's just go in and dance some more. A little. At the end of the evening, she asked him to give her a ride home. When they got there, she invited him to her house for a nightcap. When they entered her apartment, James found her very stern, somewhat cold, and he hoped she wasn't like that. She wasn't. After showing him the bedroom, she sat on the bed, kicked off her shoes, and began to remove her thigh-high stockings. With her skirt pulled up all the way, James instantly fell in love with her long legs. James, could you help me with this? He walked over, knelt in front of her, and slowly pulled down his stockings. After each move, he kissed her leg until he kissed both her feet. Slowly he worked his way back up her legs with kisses and frequent pauses to lick. By the time he got there higher, she was lying on her back with her eyes closed. Thus began what would become the most erotic experience of James's life. After a while, she relaxed and just lay there. The next couple of hours passed in a blur for James. There are a few left in his mind. Beautiful images. The night turned into a weekend and James was completely consumed by lust love. Erica wanted to get married right now. James was tempted, but he was careful. He retreated and didn't see her for several days but he just couldn't stay away. Things came to a heed when Erica wanted them to go to Sweden to meet her parents. James, this is going to be a wonderful journey, and I just know my parents are going to fall in love with you just like I do. They flew to London, staying at the Connaught Hotel for a few days. 
The afternoon was spent mainly on sightseeing and shopping. In the evenings, they went to several performances and enjoyed dishes that were out of this world. Every night ended with very lustful sex. James and Erica moved to Malmo, where her parents lived. Malmo is a fairly large city in southern Sweden, opposite Denmark. James really enjoyed this visit. Her father, Arna, was a professor at the Department of Historical Archaeology at Lund University. He invited James to lunch at school and told him about some of his research projects. Given their common interests, they got along very well. From there, they went to Stockholm for a week. They stayed in a small but very comfortable hotel, converted from a 700-year-old warehouse. The stairs leading to their room on the second floor were stone, with a trough in the middle, worn by thousands of people over hundreds of years. The hotel was located on Gamla Stan, Old Town, a small island in the center of Stockholm. The city was founded in the 13th century. With 33 restaurants in the small town, eating out was easy. Since the nightlife was so different from London, they spent a lot more time in their room getting to know each other. The highlight for James was the night ferry ride to Helsinki. After leaving Stockholm, the ferry passed thousands of small islands before reaching the open waters of the Baltic Sea. Many islands had one or more houses. One very small island that caught his attention was completely covered with a house. At sunset, they stood at the stern and looked toward Stockholm. Hugging Erica and looking at the beautiful clouds with red streaks, James felt his doubts disappear. That night, their lovemaking was less physical and more sensual, at a slower, more loving pace. Finally, after three months of marriage, they went to Las Vegas, got married, and had a wonderful honeymoon at the Venetian Hotel. Erica had never been to Vegas before and was blinded by the bright lights, crowds, and noise. The 24x7 atmosphere was a revelation for her. The next year was perfect for James. His work with the Foundation was both complex and responsible. Erica was incredible. She was sweet, caring, and very, very responsive. She finished her internship and they were talking about having children. Mark periodically suggested to him that she start doing legal work for the Foundation. It was similar to what she was working on with her law firm, and as Mark noted, it would only take a couple of days a week, so it wouldn't stop them from having a baby. James traveled quite often, usually overnight, sometimes for a couple of nights when he went to Detroit. Erica, as a new lawyer, worked late quite often. Sometimes, when she returned home late, she did not feel like making love. Other times, everything was fine. James didn't think too much about it. Once at a party, he stood on the edge of the balcony, enjoying the silence. Hidden behind a large potted bush, he didn't see anyone approaching, but suddenly he heard a couple talking quietly. First there was a woman's voice saying with some despair, I don't know what to do. I'm really falling in love with him. Somewhat quieter, in a voice that James could barely hear and only partially understand, the man said something like, Wa, ta, take this tape. About, listen. Call me, uh. With these words, the couple walked away. Damn, that looked like Erica. Thinking for a minute, then, shuddering, he moved around the bush, but the couple disappeared. He thought about it for several days before it got out of his head. He didn't say anything to Erica because he really didn't know what to say. In early December, James flew to Milwaukee on a two-day trip to meet with some members of the history department at the University of Wisconsin. Milwaukee. They had heard about some of his accomplishments and wanted to talk to him about it. They had the funding available. They just wanted to do it right. As soon as he arrived at the school, he learned that four of the professors who were supposed to be there were playing golf and were involved in a minor accident on the way back to school. They were fine, but couldn't make it to the meeting. James said everything was fine. He asked the secretary to call and book him a return ticket for a late flight and invited the head of the department to dinner just to chat. He didn't bother calling Erica. She was probably still in meetings at work. James returned to their new home around 11 o'clock. Erica's car was there, but all the lights seemed to be off. As he walked down the hallway toward the master bedroom, he saw a sliver of light under the door and then heard muttering that sounded like quiet conversation. As he started to open the door, he heard Erica say, How much longer do I have to go on with this charade? 
You know that I really love him now. I didn't plan for this, but it just happened. I don't care about money anymore. I just want James. Someone, apparently Mark, responded, Just hold on tight until that idiot hires you as a foundation lawyer. He's got a ton of money locked up in that stupid history program, and with you, it'll be easier for us to get our hands on it. Most of his personal wealth is in trusts, and it will take more time. I completely planned for the car accident. In the meantime, unless you want me to give this tape to James and the police, you will continue to give me this great sex. James quietly opened the door a little more to make sure it was Mark. Through the gap, he could see his lovely wife and Mark Braxton sitting naked in bed, Erica with tears in her eyes and mascara running. Damn it, he thought. His bed, his wife. James quickly weighed his options. His anger told him to tear Mark to pieces and throw his faithful wife out the door. Deciding that he needed to think things over, even with money, killing Mark might be a risky proposition. He went down to his office picked up his favorite peated Isley Bruich Laddich single malt and poured himself a more than generous glass. Having calmed down, he decided that he would like a slow, steady, more destructive response best. Mark was a settled issue. James felt only the hot fire of pure hatred for him. Erica, well, he didn't know about her. He thought, I love her. I don't know how this started, but from what I hear, she wishes it didn't happen. I can't live with her anyway. If he blackmailed or threatened her, she should have come to me. Yes, it would have been all over for us, but I would have taken care of her, given her money and sent her back to Malmo. Now the most I would be willing to do is keep her out of jail. Sleeping with that asshole Mark was terrible for me. He quietly left and went to the hotel for the night. The next morning, James called a fishing buddy in Ann Arbor with whom he had invested significant sums. His friend started a new security company that designed and manufactured surveillance equipment and had a consulting department to assist clients. James explained his problem and what he wanted to do. James stayed mostly away from home for the next week, telling Erica that several emergencies had occurred. He just came in a few times to pick up some clothes and leave. Reflecting on what he had overheard, he only drove rental cars and changed them daily. A week later, his friend called. You won't like this, but we have everything on film, everything we need. We filmed Mark and your Erica twice in bed and in conversation. It turned out that Mark has known Erica for several years, more for sex than for anything else. After a while, he began to complain to her about one idiot whose money he manages and who simply throws it away. Erica asked several times if there was any way to get some of James's money. They came up with a plan to let you and her meet at a party, see if she could seduce you, and with her sweet, loving ways, make you marry her. The other part was for Mark to find a way to see that you met your untimely death. It was amazing how patient they were. I will say, the friend continued, that your wife seems to have changed her mind. They argue a lot, but it turns out that Mark has an audio recording that completely incriminates Erica. It seems like he's keeping her around not just for the plot, but also to get her to keep having sex. I'd say she truly hates that bastard, and I'll give her credit. She doesn't enjoy sex. Mark is very angry with her. I expect him to become violent with her very soon. Jesus, James replied. He was devastated. He fully accepted Erica's love, he always knew that Mark was an asshole, but to do something like that. After the conversation, they took the materials to the police. Mark should have been arrested and prosecuted. Erica would be asked to act as a witness and avoid prosecution. If she agreed, she would be allowed to return to Sweden and never return. James would give her some money, but not as much as if she had come to him herself. A few days later, they were both arrested. At his arraignment hearing, Mark posted $500,000 bail and quickly disappeared. James met with Erica in an interview room at his lawyer's office. He cared about her very much and wanted to understand what happened. She was a little hysterical and said, Oh my God, I don't know. I guess I was too caught up in thinking about money. I had sex regularly with both you and Mark, and the secrecy and the thought of all that money made it so exciting. Looking at him, she snorted, I really ruined the plan, damn it. I fell in love with you. 
If only I had stopped to think about it. You should have talked to me. You know I couldn't continue our marriage, but I will take care of you. I really love you. I didn't realize how much until we got caught. Now I just regret that I didn't meet you before I met Mark. Oh God, I'm so sorry, James. I'll do everything in my power to help put this scoundrel in prison after the police catch him. James continued to live his life. Mark disappeared and Erica was placed under house arrest with a security bracelet until Mark was apprehended. After the annulment proceedings began, James moved from his new home to his home in Baldwin for a period of time. He just needed some rest. Al called several times with updates on donations and the scholarship program. James always made sure that he also provided the latest news about Beverly. In his last call, he talked a little more about how Bev was doing. She sure was a surprise. She's doing great at school, and everyone has a crush on her. She asks about you all the time. Al continued, A few guys are trying to hang around her, but they're not having much luck. She's really opened up. She's not nearly as shy. If you want to know what I think, it's that she's got her eye on you. Should... Should I tell her about Mark and Eric and the annulment? She's working with Mark's replacement, but has no idea about everything that happened. No, James replied. Don't tell her anything. I don't want to distract her from her studies. You can say hi to her from me and wish her to keep up the good work. I'll try to get there in a few weeks. Thanks for everything. You and your family have done for both Beverly and me. No problem, Al replied. Like I said... We all love her like our own. After a couple of weeks, James was remembering everything that had happened over the past year or so. One person kept coming back to his mind, Beverly. At first, he was just curious, wondering how she was doing. Was she happy? As agreed, they had their first lunch at the end of Beverly's first semester. Everything went very well, and James was amazed at how much she grew, not only through her coursework, but also personally. She was much more open and attractive than he remembered. He chuckled, thinking that she must have been a late bloomer. At the end of her second semester, they had another meeting, this time for dinner at a really upscale restaurant. James was again quite impressed with her continued progress. She was delighted with her research. She was more animated, almost radiant. Beverly learned to dress better and took a couple of electives in art and music history. They had a great dinner and he made some suggestions about her studies. The main one was that he wanted her to spend every summer in Europe, starting in France. He wanted her to not only study history, but to see it up close. He said he would ask Mark to arrange everything. The dinner ended somewhat awkwardly when she finally asked him about the ring on his left hand. She hadn't heard that he was married. When he told her about Eric, tears came to her eyes and she ran away without saying goodbye. Thinking back on those tears, he wondered what they meant. He decided to go to Kalamazoo to see her. He recently purchased a small but attractive residential complex near the university to house scholarship students. There were six buildings, each a two-story duplex clustered around a central picnic area and swimming pool. There was a small stream with many trees running around the complex. Beverly moved there because it was much closer to the university, Several other spaces have been leased to professors, but it will be several months before they are filled. It was late when he got to the complex, around nine, but he felt it wasn't too late to go in and see her. The complex was silent, except for the sound of the waterfalls in the stream and the whisper of the wind in the trees. There was good lighting, but it was somewhat dim. James made a mental note to update it. As he approached her apartment, he noticed that the lights were on on both the first and second floors, the other block, on the right, has been repainted and is not yet rented. As he approached the door to knock, he heard a piercing scream from inside. The door was locked, so he kicked it open and ran inside. From above came sounds similar to struggles and groans. James rushed up the stairs to the open bedroom door. What he saw shocked him for a second. There Mark fought with Beverly. Her blouse was torn and blood was flowing from her nose and lips from Mark's blows. James screamed at Mark and lunged at him at the same time. All his rage from seeing him with Erica and seeing him attack, Beverly exploded into angry anger. Mark turned, dazed, just in time to meet James's blow. That was all that was required, but James didn't realize it. 
He swung again and crushed Mark's jaw. He started kicking him and only stopped when Beverly wrapped her arms around him and tried to pull him away. He glanced at Mark and turned to Beverly. He expected her to become hysterical, but she was calm. The police took Mark away. It turned out that he had money hidden and was planning to flee the country using a different identity card. He lusted after Beverly every time he saw her and always remembered James's warning not to get involved with her. Now that he was ready to leave, he decided he could repay them both at once. He called to tell Beverly that some forms needed to be signed immediately. She didn't want to. She was always a little afraid of him, but he insisted. He said he was going on vacation for a couple of weeks and the forms were supposed to be signed that day, so she finally agreed. When she opened the door, he immediately slapped her and dragged her upstairs. After the police took Mark away in an ambulance, James took Beverly to the school infirmary to get checked out. She was fine, and he took her to his car. Beverly, the lock on your apartment door is broken, so I don't want to take you there. I don't think we can even stop by to pick up anything for you since we have no idea how long the police will be there. Why don't I get you a hotel room? We can pick you up some clothes on the way. James, I don't want to be a nuisance. Bev, can I call you that? I insist. There was only one good hotel in town, and James took her there. The only room available was the honeymoon suite. James laughed at this, but Beverly was embarrassed. After she settled into her room, he suggested they go downstairs for dinner. The grill here is really excellent, okay? Bev stopped arguing with James and just started agreeing. It seemed easier and she was still a little shocked. She timidly asked, Will they have steak? Will it? Girl, you're getting the biggest steak you've ever tasted. Placing their little hand in his, they took the elevator down to the grill. And yes, Bev had the biggest steak she had ever seen. Sitting there after dessert and feeling a little tired from eating, Beverly thanked him again for saving her from Mark. Bev, I'm really sorry that I've been a little neglectful of you. I really didn't mean for so much time to pass. I'm really glad to see you again. I think the last dinner date didn't end very well, but I really enjoyed it. I never had a chance to tell you about it in the apartment, but I was thinking about you. Beverly blushed slightly but didn't answer James, remembering that he was married to Erica. After a few awkward moments, James said, I better take you to your room. You must be tired. As they walked towards the elevator, Bev gently took his arm. When James opened her door, she started to walk in, but quickly turned around to thank him again. He was closer than she thought, and she ran into him. He instinctively hugged her and kissed her. Beverly responded with a quick passion that startled them both, but she suddenly pulled back and pushed him away. James looked at her pale face and asked, Bev, what's wrong? I know it was just a kiss, but I actually felt something. James, she blurted out. I felt it too. I don't know how to say it, but I suddenly felt dizzy. But James, we can't do this. We just can't. But why? What's the matter? It seems so right. Jesus, James, don't make this difficult. You know why. With these words, she quickly closed the door and put on the chain. Feeling completely confused, James walked down to his car. On the way home, he thought about everything that had happened. He really felt a connection with Beverly, or Bev, as he thought of her now. Arriving home, he drank a glass of smoky single malt whiskey and went to bed. It was not easy to fall asleep. He lay there with his eyes wide open, thinking about the kiss. He reflected, I think she's been on my mind since the day she first came to my house, asking for help. But God, after that kiss, it feels like she's all I can talk about now. Think. The next day he drove back and first stopped it at the police station. They agreed for Beverly to return to her apartment and said they would immediately send someone to remove the crime scene tapes. Then he went to a locksmith he knew and arranged for him to fix the lock that same morning. Back at the hotel, he went upstairs to see if Bev had had breakfast. When she opened the door to his knock, he quickly asked if she wanted to go down to the grill. Without looking at him, she said, Thanks, James, but I ate earlier. 
Well, I can't take you back to the apartment before the locksmith is done with the door. Would you like a ride? No, you've already spent too much time with me. James grabbed her hands and asked, Beverly, what happened? Everything was great until I kissed you. I guess I overstepped my bounds. I'm so sorry. No, it was okay. In fact, it was great. And if only things had been different. He took her hand and led her to a chair. Okay, that's enough. I have no idea what you're talking about. If you don't explain what's going on, I guess I'll just have to throw you over my knee and spank you. Looking scared, half believing he would do it, she muttered. You know, it's your wife, Erica. James burst out laughing, causing Beverly to blush in embarrassment. Raising his left hand, he said to her, Look at my hand. Do you see the ring? He explained everything that had happened to Mark and his wife. Beverly hadn't heard anything about it, especially about Mark running away from the police. Taking Bev's hands and lifting her up, James slowly walked towards her and kissed her slowly, tenderly. When he stopped, she stepped back, looked at him for a long minute, and said happily, Hey, I thought we were going for a ride. After driving around the area a bit, he took her to lunch at the golf club above Morrow Lake. After eating, they sat on the grass above the lake, not really talking, just sitting quietly, both lost in their own thoughts. He later drove her back to her apartment. Even though the castle is fixed, I don't feel right leaving you here after last night. But I think you want to be alone. He turned and walked away. It's okay, James. Confused, he turned around. What do you mean? I mean, it's okay. I won't be alone because you'll stay with me tonight. Sure. I think I can do it and we'll figure something out later. No, James, you don't understand. I love you and will always want you to be with me. I'm not asking. I'm just telling you that it will be so. He just stared at her, confused and somewhat dazed. James... Remember when I pulled you away from that creepy mark, and you looked at me strangely, as if you thought I should still be screaming? James, James, I knew you would come. Of course I was scared, but somewhere, and this is really important, deep down I knew. I probably fell in love with you from the first lesson I took from you. But I was such a mouse and so afraid of men. Now I want you to shut up and let me give you what I offered the day I came to you for help. Later that year... James and Bev married. She had their first child, a girl just after she finished her master's degree and a boy just after finishing her Ph.D. James discovered that she had a passion for something other than history. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.